Can you guys hear me now? Yes, sir. All right. Oh, I heard somebody speaking back. So last time the microphone was working to deliver my voice, but not to deliver y'all to me. But I just heard someone reply to me. Was that Austin that replied? Oh, it was me. Oh, Kobe. Gotcha. No problem. So I'm finally got it working. And uh, does anybody have any questions while we wait for more people to get here? I also need to double check my memory of what we did last time. I checked it last night, but now I completely forgot. That's not good. Getting old really stinks. I mean, beats the alternative, but still it stinks. So last time I seemingly, no, that was way back on the 10th. I know I did. Today's Thursday, so I did the 16th. Where's my 16th? Let's see, 11, 11. Let's see, 11, 3, 11, 1. Maybe this is it. And that's 11, 11 as well. Stupid me. Does anyone have their notes? <laughs> Uh, there's the 16th one. Okay. Well, that's the odd thing I wrote. That's because it's an entirely different class. Okay. That was not supposed to be. Let's see the other one. Ah, okay. So last time it appears we did. Uh, I showed you the usefulness of uh, the McLaurin series. I gave you the answers for sine X, for cosine X, for E to the X. I told you about Euler theorem, E to the I theta equals cosine theta plus I sine theta. Uh, and then I showed you the simple pendulum, the physical pendulum. I worked an example for a simple pendulum. I worked an example for a physical pendulum. I then did the uh, damp harmonic oscillator and worked out way more details than were really necessary. But I, I showed you at the end of it what it was. And it turned out, uh, which hopefully you guys got this, because the whole reason I did all this extra stuff is I didn't get it the first time around. I didn't get it filled up my differential equations class. But only in one instance do you get any oscillatory motion whatsoever, uh, meaning uh, something that's related to a sine or a cosine. And that's in that uh, uh, underdamp case. In the other two cases, you get a sum of differentials, excuse me, a sum of exponentials uh, in the overdamp case. And in the critically damp case, you get an exponential times a linear function. So uh, we did do that. Now, today we're starting into a new chapter. We've, we've skipped from chapter 11 uh, all the way up to chapter 14. And then uh, that was what we already done. And then we uh, are now going to chapter 15, which is uh, wave motion. So I need to talk to you first about some, some of the basics of waves. There are multiple types of waves. They're all, uh, all of them have very uh, specific characteristics that are similar from one place to the next uh, in many ways. And in other ways, they're, they're not so much. So some examples of waves uh, in everyday life, you've seen ocean waves, of course, and ocean waves are a little more complicated than you might suspect. And, and we're not talking about the wave when it actually starts to crest. So once it gets to the cresting, that's something different going on. It's not really what we define as a wave. What we do define as a wave is some kind of uh, repetitive thing that delivers energy from one place to another. In that sense, uh, a stadium wave is a wave. So it's, it's not a mechanical wave because there's no mechanical device that forces person next to another person to stand up when that other person stood up. Uh, so it's more like a psychological wave, if you will, because you, you see the person next to you stand up, you feel compelled to stand up. And what happens is the person next to you lifts, so their potential energy goes up. And then you start seeing them lifting. So you start lifting. And then they get to the top. They sit back down. And you get, you get to the top. So now your potential energy is at a maximum. And then all of a sudden, the person next to you starts rising again. And you start to go back down. So now their potential energy is up. So you can see slowly but surely the potential energy is running around the whole stadium. Okay. So in that sense, it is delivering potential energy from point A to point B. 
and it's repetitive in motion. And I've seen them go around six or seven times at bowl games and stuff like that. So that's kind of a neat thing. So in that in that sense, it's a wave, but specifically we're talking about more like mechanical waves and stuff of that sort. So the ocean wave is a good characteristic. Uh, one you might not think of too much is uh, my banjo over there. My banjo is a string instrument. So it has, in, in my case, I play a five string gram, uh, banjo and the five string actually has a little drone string that uh, doesn't go all the way to the head. But anyways, that those little strings, when I pluck them, they vibrate and that's that forms what's called a, called a standing wave. And what's going on there is waves are rushing back and forth at just the right rate where they're constructively and destructively interfering at specific spots and making nodes and anti-nodes at other spots. So that's another type of wave. It's called a wave on a string. Uh, there's earthquakes, there's pressure waves, there's electromagnetic waves. And electromagnetic waves are particularly interesting because that's light and that's what Maxwell predicted even before it existed, before we knew it existed. And of course, Heinrich Hertz was the first one to discover it. And about the same time, uh, other people were trying to do the same thing, but didn't quite beat uh, Hertz to the punch on that one. So we have those waves. And then those waves is really odd because the there's an electric field that's oscillating in one plane. And then there's a magnetic field that's oscillating in another plane. And those two planes are perpendicular. And then there's a third direction, but it's perpendicular to both of those. And that's the direction it's going. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting. That's another waveform. Uh, so those are all different waves. Sound is a wave. Sounds a very different wave than, than those waves we just talked about. Uh, earthquakes are waves, and they actually are complex, like the ocean waves, sort of. But sound waves, for instance, are what we call longitudinal waves. The electromagnetic wave uh, is a, a transverse wave, and the ocean is sort of a little bit different altogether. But again, uh, let's talk about what those waves are. So transverse waves are waves that oscillate fancy word for vibrate back and forth or go back and forth, right? They oscillate in a direction perpendicular to their propagation. Propagation, fancy word for velocity. <laughs> okay, it's actually fancy word for going. So when a wave oscillates in one direction or basically one dimension and then moves perpendicular to that direction, that's a, that's a transverse wave, okay? Examples of that are sort of again an ocean wave but not really uh but definitely electromagnetic radiation definitely waves on a string uh so, and some other things uh, pressure wave for instance that that could go either way uh but usually that's a, a, another one uh usually that's an, uh, the other type now also we have sound waves and sound waves like i said are longitudinal so if you want to think about that here's another wave that we can picture to model both transverse and longitudinal waves so we take a slinky which everybody knows is sort of a big spring uh or you just take a, a long spring that's not so big so it's easier to handle and i attach it to a, long, a wall a good distance away and i pull it tight and now what i do is i lift up I lift down uh, or lower down. I lift up, lower down, lift up, lower down. And I just keep doing that. Then I become the repetitive source of the wave. And each time I do that, when I pull up like this, this ring that I'm holding to in that spring is pulling up on the ring next to it. And that one's pulling up on the ring next to it. And that one's pulling up on the ring next to it. And I, that was pulling up on the ring next to it. And then when I get to the top, then I start pulling down on this ring and this ring continues to go up this ring continues to go up this ring continues to go up until that one starts to go down and starts pulling the other one down and what you see is this hump that i've created just oscillate or travels along this way so that's a transverse wave and in fact each time i do it i get another hump downward and then i get another hump upward and another hump downward and another hump upward and it just keeps traveling back and forth or along the spring when it gets to the wall, the wall's fixed. So this hump is coming towards the wall like this. And when it gets to the hook in the wall, it tries to pull up on that hook. And Newton's third law says that for every action, there's equal but opposite reaction. So that wall responds by pulling down on that spring. That actually causes the spring's hump to flip upside down. So now you got a, a, a upside down hump going back this way. And then next to it will be a, a right side up hook hump. And that came from the downside hook hump. When the, when the downside hump gets to the hook, 
this one pulls down on the hook, the hook pulls up on it and turns it into a right side up wave. So it's actually flipping the waves when you hit a, a fixed wall and it sends the waves back upside down. Now, if you send them out at just the right rate, then what will happen is you'll have like a uh, anti-node dead center. That's a place of high vibration and a node at each end, just in front of my hand, for instance, is a node, right? Uh, my hand is actually somewhat of an anti-node, but I don't use a huge uh, amplitude. I can do it like that. And then you'd see that there's an anti-node right next, uh, or excuse me, a node right next to it. And what you end up getting when I have a node at each end is, uh, is the spring humped up, the spring humped down, spring humped up, spring humped down, spring humped up, spring humped down. That's called the fundamental frequency for that particular spring. Okay. If I do it a little more rapidly, then the, the one half will be up while the other half's down and you've got another node in the middle. If I do it uh, more rapidly still, then I'll have two nodes uh, a third of the way each way. So I've got one hump up here, one hump down here, one hump up here, and then it reverses and so on and so forth. Each of those are standing waves and they're very specific. That's what makes the music that you hear when you pluck your strings. Uh, most of what you hear is the first uh, harmonic, which is also called the fundamental frequency. And But you also get the second harmonic and what's called the first overtone or the third harmonic, which is called the fourth overtone. So, uh, excuse me, which is called the uh, uh, third overtone and so on and so forth. The overtone is always one number smaller than the harmonic. So that's a transverse wave. Now let's take that same slinky and instead of doing it transversely, I'm going to pull it taut and I'm going to do this. So when I push the slinky this way, what's happening is those rings of the, of the spring or slinky are getting compressed together. That calls what uh, that causes what we call a compaction. Compaction. And then I push it and then I come to a stop and then I let it go. That thing's moving, 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 continues to move because what it's done now is because it's so tight, it's pulling on the springs next to it. So it's making them become tight and that's bringing on the ones next to it and that's making them go tight. So that little compaction is going to continue running, running, running this way. Now, at the same time, I'm starting to pull back. So I'm making the spring rings separate and that's called a rarefaction, R-A-R-E-F-A-C-T-I-O-N, okay? I always thought the word should be rare, rarefaction, but that's not it, okay? It's just rarefaction. And then I come back forward and I make another compression, compaction and then I go backward and I make another rare fraction. So I get a, a series of rare fraction, compaction, rare fraction, compaction, rare fraction, compactions, and they're all moving this way. So the, the oscillation in this case is forward and backwards, and the velocity is just forward. So that's a trend, uh, that's a uh, actual longitudinal wave, which is obviously the opposite of a transverse wave. Does that make sense to everyone? Can you have both at the same time? Like if you were waving the slinky up and down and? <laughs> Yes, and exactly. That's what I keep hinting at with regards to the ocean wave. If you actually go now, you might not be able to go in Virginia Beach or North Carolina or whatever, because uh, we only get maybe three or four days of like this a, a year. But if you go out to the ocean on a day where it's really, really clear, it normally takes, you know, about a week of a, of a eastern wind and then maybe a day of a really light wind from the east. Uh, that usually settles out the sediment enough where you can actually see down to the bottom, even 15, 20, 30 foot of visibility. If you do that and you swim out past the breakers, then you'll get out there to a point, hopefully it's a little bit, say, deeper than, uh, deeper than you can touch unless you, you know, swim down, uh, mainly because you don't want to plant yourself on the ground. You want to just see what happens. So you swim out that far, you look down and identify some spot in the sand on the bottom. Uh, maybe it's a hermit crab, maybe it's a skate eye, maybe it's a piece of trash or whatever, but ideally something that's stuck to the ground and actually is not moving. And what you'll notice is when a wave starts coming towards you, it'll suck you to it. So you see yourself moving out to sea and then it lifts you up and brings you to your peak height and then it drags you forward with it with the long, same way it goes and you come back to your same spot right over that that object in the bottom. So you're seeing you're actually moving in a vertical circle. That means that ocean wave is actually both. It's a transverse wave because you see yourself will go up and down, but it's also a longitudinal wave because it's forcing you to go forward and backwards. Now, 
that's effect uh, definitely happens. You can see that forward and backwards motion really good when you get to the breakers because uh, it really does a lot more there. But yeah, that's basically what ocean wave is. It's a mixture of the two. Good question, David. Anybody else? Now, uh, another example of, of a wave is the earthquake. And this is an important one that you should understand. So when an earthquake occurs, basically what's going on is you have two chunks of the earth that are uh, in different stresses. So maybe this chunk wants to go this way and this chunk wants to go that way, right? But they're hung up because there's a lot of friction. There's jig jigs and jags and all sorts of stuff of rock holding it together. But eventually what can happen is whatever's holding that up can give way just enough where it shifts. When that happens, that creates not only a lot of heat because you're, you know, scraping vibrational, I mean, frictionally uh, strong forces against each other, but it's also going to cause vibrations. And that would be like the epicenter of an earthquake. Now that sends out waves and it sends out two types. It sends out uh, P waves, which uh, I've always considered to be called pressure waves, but I've been advised by a friend who is a geologist told me they use it for P as in primary wave because that one gets to the detectors first. Uh, I don't know, it's not my field, but I would assume the geologist knows more about that than me. So anyways, the P wave or the pressure wave or the primary wave, and that is actually a transverse wave. So if you actually seen any footage, it, there exists some footage of actual uh, large enough areas of a field during an earthquake where you can actually see the earth sort of uh, surface sort of do this. That's a transverse wave. It's literally a wave traveling along the surface of the earth. Uh, and it does that all through the rock as well. So you can see rocks doing that if you could, you know, be inside the earth. Uh, but that's the primary way. But there's also an S wave, which, excuse me, that's not the primary. I'm sorry I said that. That's the S wave, which is a shear wave. And the primary wave is the longitudinal one. I, I was so uh, hung up on telling you that, uh, that a geologist told me to call it the P wave for primary as opposed to pressure like we were learning uh, that I completely set it for the wrong part. So yeah, that vibrational thing we're seeing is a shear wave, like, like it looks more like an ocean wave, even though we know now that an ocean wave does both. But the shear wave goes through all the solid rock, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, the primary wave, which is that longitudinal one like sound, that one actually goes through, uh, through everything. All it has to have is matter because it's got to be able to push matter together and then shake it and stretch it apart and then push it together and then stretch it apart. So you can sort of see how you seemingly need to have, have matter or something, some kind of material, obviously matter would be a good choice uh, for, a, uh, for a longitudinal wave to travel. What's not as obvious is you don't actually need uh, matter for certain transverse waves to travel. So for instance, the electromagnetic radiation from our sun for a long time, people assumed that the ether existed specifically because they didn't, couldn't imagine waves traveling through nothing. So the electromagnetic radiation, which certainly is making it to the Earth because that's what keeps us warm, uh, if the space was a vacuum, then you would think that without matter, the wave couldn't make it to us. But we determined later that, in fact, that can go through a vacuum just, just fine. Okay. So... Uh, the one thing is definitely uh, longitudinal waves, all of those have to have matter. That's why you can't have sound in space and stuff like that, okay? Now, when the earthquake does occur, you have an earthquake down below the epicenter, so, uh, the, below the surface of the earth at the epicenter, and that sends out waves in every direction. So the earth would be like this, and maybe this uh, earthquake occurs right here, just below the surface of the top of the earth in our diagram. So that wave is gonna go out this way, this way, that way. The S wave and the P wave are both going out from the same uh, source in the same directions, but in all directions. Now we have detectors all over the surface of the earth that can detect them. And of course, the farther the detector is away from the epicenter, the longer it takes the wave to get there, uh, but also the more complex the path could be. So it turns out over time watching these things, we're able to piece together hypotheses about what the earth is made of, you know, how hard is the material, how soft is the material, how dense is the material, and these turn out to be the things that relate to wave speed, and uh, through an idea of us making hypotheses, and then making predictions with those, then testing the hypothesis prediction, 
And then going back and refining the hypothesis, we've come up with sort of some very robust theories about what the inner structure of the earth is. So we know there's a mantle and a crust and all that good stuff. And, and there's multiple ways, by the way, of, of categorizing it. And one of them is about density and the other one's about hardness. So that's why you get things like lithosphere, but you also get the crust and you get uh, all those different term, terms. Well, by doing this over time, what we found is that in fact, the waves tend to take the path of least time. And that means they sometimes curve towards the faster areas. So the wave uh, leaving a leaving a epicenter doesn't necessarily go in a straight line. A lot of times it'll curve and then come back up. But slowly putting that together, we've made a lot of conclusions about what the surface of the earth and, and the subsurface of the earth is made of. And in fact, we find consistently blank spots where no S waves get through whatsoever. Well, S waves can't get through a liquid. Now that sounds weird because you think S wave, you think shear wave, and a shear wave sure looks like a transverse wave, which is exactly what it is. And here we are talking about the ocean having shear waves or having uh, transverse waves, right? So here's the big deal. When you have a transverse wave on the surface of the ocean, uh, that's different than having a transverse wave going through the ocean, okay? The difference is this, if you're a molecule in the ocean as opposed to at the ocean surface, then you are free to move any way you want and there's no net force pulling you one way or the other because you might think, well, this molecule down here is giving me a good tug downward. Well, guess what? There's a molecule right above it that's giving it the same pull upward. And then there's a molecule to the right of it that's giving the same pull as the one to the left and to the upper left is the bottom right and to the upper right is the bottom left. All of those forces are canceling each other out. So there's no compunction for one molecule to pull another molecule with it. However, once you get to the surface of the ocean, then you've got a string of molecules right on top. And like this molecule right here, right at the top, has a molecule below it that's pulling it downward and nothing to counteract that. It has a molecule to the right and downward pulling this way, nothing to counteract that. And another one this way pulling that way, nothing to counteract that. So if you go to try to pinch water, you'll see the water actually sort of sticks to your hand at some point, and you'll actually see some of it come up like it's attached. That's surface tension. So with that surface tension, you can actually compel waves to make shear waves because there's a, a force that holds the water particles next to each other on the surface. Inside of the Earth, there's no such surface, so you're not going to get the S waves. So over time, we've watched where all those S waves are disappearing, and we've put together a model of the, the Earth that tells us, you know, the outer part is definitely rock and stone and metal and all sorts of stuff like that, as is the inner part. And the deeper you go, the denser the materials get, and it turns out our core is an iron-nickel core, so there's iron and nickel, the two densest metals that we have. And the outer core is, in fact, liquid. And we can you know, definitively tell where that liquid core begins. But here's the weird part. That, you know, by making those hypotheses about where it begins and then watching several data, we've, we've nailed down exactly where that liquid core starts. And we've got a really good feel for that. But here's the weird part. When you get down through it, it turns out uh, using the ideas of Copernicus, which is not, not that uh, we need to go back to circles, but the fact that we are not special, that's the Copernican idea, the Copernican revolution I talk about. Uh, that is the idea that we are not special in the sense that if I go anywhere else in the universe, they're going to have the same laws of physics as we have here. There's not special laws just for us, right? And that's what the Copernican revolution is about. Uh, you know, it's also that, that picture of a big, you know, spiral galaxy that you see on people's shirts. And it got a little arrow pointing to one insignificant white spot and says, you are here. Uh, that, that's the continuance of the Copernican revolution, uh, as is uh, the theory of evolution, where we're but one little leaf on a giant tree of life that all descended from one common ancestor. All that continues the idea that we're, quote unquote, not special. And they don't mean it in a derogatory way. They just mean that, that, that you know, physics does what it does. So with that in mind, you have to say, OK, well, whatever conditions I can create on the surface of the Earth, if they're like that, below the earth then it's going to behave the material is going to behave the same way below the earth as it does at the surface of the earth so by uh studying that same kind of uh composition of materials that are down in the inner core 
and subjecting it to the same pressures and temperatures that we have, what we discover is inside that liquid core is in fact a solid core. So our earth actually has a solid core, then a uh, sphere with a hole in it, spherical liquid core, and then a uh, hard core on the outside of all that. And of course the crust is a little part as well, but all that is what makes up earth. And that's all from knowing about waves. So you can see there's really a good idea or a good re reason to study waves because it can give us so many great ideas about how things behave, uh, make us better understand the universe and so on and so forth. Now to go further with that, I need to discuss the parts of waves and explain more what I mean by a wave is something that repeats itself in space and time and carries energy from one point to another. So that's really the sort of the definition of a wave is something that repeats itself in space and time and carries energy from one place to another. Not necessarily mass, by the way. Okay, that's why I- a question. Wait. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, what I was just gonna say is that if you said that S waves can't penetrate liquids, then how do um, earthquakes cause tsunamis? Ah. So that is an actual, uh, and the S wave and the P wave both can contribute to a tsunami, by the way. Uh, but that's basically a tsunami is some part of the, the surface of the bottom of the ocean or just below the bottom of the ocean. There's an earthquake. And that actually would cause like, you can imagine just a big cylinder of the earth falling down on the bottom of the ocean. Going, now all of a sudden you got this huge uh, cylindrical shaft. That's like a simple idea of what an earthquake could be, just a big chunk of the bottom sinking down. Well, what's going to happen immediately with that is the water is going to fall in, and that's literally going to cause like a depression at the surface. Well, that depression at the surface would then cause all the water around that circle to fill in, but it's going to overflow because it's actually going to get momentum while it's falling down there, and then that'll make it high. So it'll actually go from a depression to uh, a rising and then of course that's going to have to fix itself so that rising is going to have to fall back down but it's got momentum so it's going to go too far again and then that's going to repeat itself and it's going to keep doing that for a little bit and that's what actually makes the tsunami so yeah it, it, it uh the tsunami can come from the s wave or the p wave and all that really has to happen is you have to have something vibrating to make a wave uh, we have a wave making machine in our TCC campus in the geology department. And if you look at that, that's literally just a big wedge. So there's a vertical side and then there's a, a metal side that's at like a 30, 40 degree angle or something like that. And that thing just pumps in and out, in and out, like right on the back of an aquarium. And each time it goes down, it pushes water out and the water will try to fill that back in and make a little hump. And then it pulls back out and it makes a little depression and then it pushes back in and makes a little hump. And those humps, depressions, humps, depressions uh, just ride along. So that's all it takes to make a wave. But yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Good thinking about the S wave. Just remember the, uh, the S wave component of it would actually make uh, the surface go like this, whereas the P wave component of it would make the surface go like this. So if you're talking about the surface, meaning the bottom of the ocean, the S wave is going to try to make it jiggle left and right, whereas the P wave is going to make it jiggle up and down, depending on you know, what angle it hits at or whatever. All right. Any other questions? All right. So let's, uh, let's make some uh, sense out of waves in general. And then I'm going to go to sort of like we did in chapter 14. Chapter 14 was kind of neat. I, I showed you the techniques that we use to solve differential equations. I don't expect you or, and I'm not going to test you on whether you can solve those differential equations, but I'm testing you on using the results. That was, you know, X equals A times cosine omega T plus phi, where omega is equal to square root of K over M. And then when I did the force, I mean, the damped harmonic oscillator, uh, the omega became B over 2M quantity squared minus K over M all under the square root. Uh, and then there was three ways that could come out. So you're not solving those differential equations. You're using the results from that. Well, the same thing here. I'm going to give you some results. Your book derives some of them. But my goal for you is to just be able to use those. And able to, use, to be able to use those, you need to know parameters. So that's what I'm going to go over now. Uh, so let's start with a wave diagram. And you're not looking at the top of my head. Just to keep it real, you know. <laughs> All right. So. A typical wave, you might plot it in uh, an XY coordinate system. 
and I'm old, so that means I gotta stop and put my glasses on every time. And what I'm gonna look at right now is a snapshot. So this is a single point in time, if you will. There's the Y, that'll be the amplitude axis. That can have a lot of different values. Right now, I'm just calling it Y, okay? But this is a snapshot. And what I mean by that is one point in time, okay? Now, you know what a wave looks like? It looks like a sine wave. And ideally, it should be a uniform material and all that good stuff. So these waves should be perfect, even though my drawings are not, they're not bad, but they're definitely not perfect. But each one should look like the other. And that's basically like a sine wave. Now, since it's a snapshot, you see no motion. But if you looked at it over time, you would see each one of these tops moving along like that in, in some direction, maybe that way or that way. This is, in fact, a transverse wave. And this part right here is called a, a crest or a peak. And this right here is called a trough. Okay. Also, you can start measuring distances on this. And it turns out if you measure the distance from one peak to the next, that's a quantity we call we give it the Greek symbol lambda, and it's called the wavelength. And of course, the wavelength dimension wise has a unit of as a dimension of L for length or a unit of meters. That's what these two symbols mean. The you know the capital L, the capital T, the capital M, those all mean dimensions. And then I put lowercase stuff next to it, and that means like the unit we use in the SI. And some typical values are, for instance, AM850, the radio station uh, that some sports uh, programs are on, that Rush Limbaugh used to be on, all that sort of stuff. The, that has waves that are literally 352 meters. So you can even imagine waves that would be kilometers long or even waves that are light years long or waves that are even as small as a nucleus. So the wavelength is always gonna be measured in meters or something. But like I said, it can have a lot of variance from one place to the other. Now, the wavelength is also the distance from one trough to the next trough, or more generically, one identical point to an identical point. Now you might say, well, this one's the same height, so that's an identical point. But no, this one has a positive slope, that one has a negative slope, so they can't be the same point, but this one can. So in fact, this is a measure of the wavelength as well, okay? So that's one of the parameters we use. Uh, another parameter we use is the distance from this equilibrium line or the no disturbance level to the peak is called the amplitude. So A equals amplitude. And the amplitude can be many things. It can be uh, like, it can be electric field, in which case the units would be uh, newtons per coulomb or volts per meter. It can be a magnetic field. As I told you, electromagnetic radiation is both of those. So this would have units of Teslas or Gauss or something like that. It can be a pressure wave. So that Y variable could be a P. And in that, that case, it'd be Newtons per square meter or Pascal, which is the equivalent of Newtons per square meter. Or it could be a sound wave, so it would be decibels. So you could say equals dB, okay? And decibel literally means a tenth of a bell, <laughs> just so you're, in case you're wondering. So these are all different things that the amplitude could be. That's why I said I'm calling it Y for right now, but really it depends on what kind of wave you're talking about. The sound wave, for instance, is a pressure wave, but this crest corresponds to a compaction. So it's also a compaction. You can sort of, sort of draw the longitudinal wave like this, but just let everybody know that this corresponds to a compaction and this corresponds to a rarefaction. Okay. So those are some parts of the wave. Uh, they're kind of handy. Obviously, they're important. Uh, now, there's also other ones, and I, and I should have done this begin with this right up here. This is 11, 18, 21. 
and this is PHY241D01C. Now I'm going to draw another wave, but this time it's going to be a point in space. Okay, so this is uh, one spot in space over time. So again, we're going to have, uh, let's say, a y-axis, which again could be all sorts of stuff. Uh, and then I'll have this midline right here. And this axis, instead of being space, we're taking one slice of space. Let's say you lay one, one line across the ocean, OK? And you look at that at a particular point in time, and what you'll see is a wave like that, okay? Now, you, since you're looking at it at a point in time, or as many point in time, what you'll see is at this particular location on this line, at zero time, there's zero height. So the ocean's perfectly flat. But if you wait a couple of seconds, you start lifting up, lifting up, lifting up, lifting up, lifting up, lifting up. Say maybe, maybe at one second, you get to a crest. And then you start falling down, falling down, falling down, falling down. In two seconds, you're back to a flat ocean. And then you fall, 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 fall more. And then at three seconds, you're at the bottom of a trough. And then you keep rising, keep rising, keep rising. At four seconds, you've completed an entire cycle. Okay, And that cycle is basically a wavelength. Now, the time that you just measured there, T, notice I'm using capital T, which is a little unfortunate, okay, just because I use T for my dimension as well of time, but this is T, and it's called the period of the wave, and T is measured in seconds. Its dimension would just be capital T. That's why I didn't even write it, but normally you measure it in, in time. And the rule is that a wave will travel a distance of, notice how far we went. We went from uh, midline peak, midline trough, midline again. So a distance of one wavelength which is lambda, by the way, in a time of one period, which is a symbol T, OK? We know speed slash velocity. We know the difference already, of course, so I don't have to really stress that that much, but I'm going to say speed slash velocity. We know that speed slash velocity is distance divided by time taken. OK? So given the sentence and that symbol right there, can anybody give me an equation for the velocity of a wave? The wavelength over the period. Very good. So velocity is equal to the wavelength over the period. And that's what we call our kinder kindergarten wave equation, OK? Now, I say kindergarten because the real wave equation is a, a second order differential equation. Uh, and you'll see that in your book. But we're not talking about that right now. We're talking about the kindergarten version. This is what we teach, you know, conceptual physics, introductory astronomy, where we, we don't require any math. That's one of the equations we use. But that's not the normal way we use it. I've got to introduce another concept. Now, there's another concept called F, where F is called the frequency. Of the wave. And F is measured in cycles per second or hertz. OK, so that's something to keep in mind. So 
uh, the frequency is the number of waves, in other words, complete waves, wavelengths, in other words, uh, cycles. It's the number of waves or cycles that pass a certain point I don't know why I put a D there, a certain, and I don't know why I put a T on the end. Evidently certain now start, ends with a T or a D. I don't know why, but clearly I've had a stroke. A certain point in a time period of 1.00 seconds, okay? So, I said the frequency is the number of waves or cycles that pass a certain point in a time period. So if I'm sitting on the on the uh, pier off 17th Street or whatever, and I see a crest of a wave being right below me, and then I start counting, and I see a next crest and a next crest and a next crest and a next crest, and I get up to five crests, and then I see, uh, I see my second is up, and I'd say my frequency is five waves per second, five cycles per second, or five hertz. Does that make sense? So I ask you, with regards to the wave that I drew up there, right, how many waves will pass you by? And I use the word how many in quotation marks, but how many waves will pass you by in a single second? One fourth. Exactly. Good job. I normally have to take the time to, to, you know, suggest that it can be a part of a wave, but you got it with uh, right off the bat. So how many waves will pass a point in one second? And you said one fourth. And that's right. And that's not a that's not a coincidence that the period of the wave is four seconds and the frequency is one fourth. In fact, we have stumbled upon something very important that the frequency is one over the period, which is also true by writing the period is one over the frequency. Okay. So we still have our other things that we also knew, which is, is this. I mean, we already knew this because this came from our circular motion study as well. And this as well. But we also already knew omega is equal to 2 pi f. And uh, because of that, you get f, uh, f is equal to omega over 2 pi, all sorts of good stuff like that. So all that stuff's still fair games. But now that we see this, and I have one over T times Lambda here, I can replace this with Lambda times what? Frequency. Exactly. And that's the other, and that's the more common, in fact, version of the kindergarten wave equation. Uh, example, now think about this without respect to this equation. Think about this example without respect to the equation. Just think about it in everyday life logical terms. Let's say this is example one. Uh, a wave is 5.00 meters long and you see three of them pass you. in a single second. A, how far can that wave travel in 1.00 seconds. B, well, let's, let's, I'll ask B in a second. I want to get the answer to this first. 
Can anybody tell me the answer to that? How far is this wave going to travel in a single second? Five meters. Five meters? Or did I miss 15. 15 meters. Yes. Uh, the wavelength is a meter is five meters so each time one of those pass you it goes five meters so that means if three of them pass you in a second then three times five uh must be the distance it traveled so the answer is yes 15.0 meters okay now that's neat because that's just common sense that that's something where we had to work out the logic of it pictured in our head but we didn't really have to use any equation but now let's let's follow up with parts B and C. So parts B and C, for instance, B, what, whoa, I don't even know what my brain was doing there. What is the wave's frequency? Answer, anyone? What's the frequency of this wave? three hertz exactly so you see how the language can can tell you what it is without actually saying it right it, three of them pass you by in a second now here's part c what is the wavelength Y'all know that answer, right? One third. Five meters. Yeah, the wavelength is the distance it is. So I gave you an idea that a wave is five meters long. That means basically the sine function is five meters from here to here is five meters. So that's the 5.00 meters. D. What is the calculated wave speed? Y'all can answer. Right, we're just going to take three, which is per second, and 15, or excuse me, and five meters, multiply them, you get 15 meters per second. And that's just what the formula says. And of course, I could ask you part D, how far can that wave travel in one second? And you'd be right back to the answer to 15 meters. So there's a lot of different ways you can think about it. That was just me trying to compel you to think about it just in the physical terms as something you can picture in your head and then go back and see how that sort of matches up with the equations. So hopefully that'll help you uh, see things. Now, with that in mind, let me give you some generic results we have. So generic results. Your book derives, like I said, some of these, but these are things you're gonna use, okay? It turns out the velocity of a wave on a string, and in, in some sense that actually could mean the velocity of a wave on a spring too, with a P instead of a T, Papa instead of tango, uh, that turns out to be the square root of, and now here's a problem. Notice I use T for period. I'm using T for tension here. So I'll put a little quotation mark around it. I don't like the using the F sub T, but that, if that makes you feel better, do that. That's what your book is doing. But it's the tension in the rope divided by mu, where T equals tension. in newtons and mu is equal to m over l or mass per unit length okay so that's one of the results we use uh, some other ones are, generally speaking, the velocity of the wave is some kind of elastic force term. Parameter. 
divided by some kind of inertia parameter. In the case of the spring, the inertia parameter, uh, inertia being mass in general, so it, it makes sense that it would be mass per unit length. And of course, the actual force was the parameter for the uh, velocity of a string, uh, or on a string. If you if you're talking about the hitting, say, the end of a rod like this with a hammer. If you're talking about hitting that, then what you're going to get is a, a compaction like this that's going to roll along the surface like this with compaction and refractions and all that stuff. And it's going to travel with a velocity v, which equals the elastic modulus e over the density rho. Okay. Now, I haven't taught you about moduli. That was in chapter 12. If you're going into engineering, you're going to learn a lot about moduli. That's why we skipped chapter 12, and you're going to learn about, a lot about fluid mechanics uh, if you go into science that's relevant to it, or if you go into engineering that's relevant to it. So that's why we don't teach you 13 either. But this is the elastic modulus. You can look it up for any particular material. Steel has one, wood has one. In fact, if you take the uh, wood structures class in the, in the engineering department at NC State, They'll have you buy Breyer's uh, wood structures uh, textbook, and with it will uh, they'll basically bundle a bunch of uh, wood for wood forest paper products uh, notes. Basically, they publish books every year where they're basically taking all their different types of wood and they're measuring the bulk modulus, the elastic modulus, the shear moment, all these different parameters that are needed for engineering. And they put them all in these books and they put formulas in there so you can look things up like the uh, uh, shear strength and all that good stuff. All that you can just look up. So you just look up what this material is that, you're, that the rod's made of and divide it by the density of the material. And that would be the velocity of the wave traveling along it. If you want the velocity, so this is for a rod, say. So that's another another velocity equation you can now use. And again, this is called the elastic modulus. And if you want to know the velocity of a wave through a fluid, and that could mean a gas or a liquid, for instance, that's the bulk modulus divided by the density. So it's the same row as over here. Any questions on that? So again, these are just formulas that you're free to use. I'm not giving you uh, the derivation of them. I'm just saying, hey, you have the right to use these now. You can solve problems using these. Uh, for instance, here's a, here's a great real life, every, everyday life example. Uh, when you take scuba diving, if you ever do, and, and I did, and I loved it, and it was like one of the coolest things I ever did. So if you take scuba diving, one of the things they'll teach you in addition to Boyle's law, which you'll learn about next semester, uh, and that's probably the most important law they teach you. But in Boyle's, I mean, in uh, scuba diving, they'll teach you that sound is omnidirectional. Omnidirectional. That means it comes from all directions. Now, what's why is that? Well, what that means is they're telling you sound appears to be coming from all directions when you hear it underwater. And what's going on is your brain uses the fact that your ears are on the two sides of your head. So when it gets a signal from the right ear and then shortly thereafter on the order of a, a millisecond or so, uh, it gets a signal from a left ear, then it says, oh, well, this must be some object on the right hand side of my person, right? So it says, okay, and over experience, over time, we've learned, you know, it's somewhat ahead of you, it sounds this way. If it's somewhat behind you, it sounds more muffled because the back of your ears are hitting it, stuff like that. So it can sort of place at least for you, 
where the sound come from uh, or came from. You say, oh, it, it came from over there or oh, it came from back there or maybe it came from this side, right? Close or something. That's what your brain does. Well, the problem with the velocity of a wave uh, in a fluid is that it depends directly, in other words, thumbs up, thumbs up on the bulk modulus, which is basically how easy it is to squeeze the fluid, which you can see in air, that's easy peasy. You know, a bicycle pump is all you need to squeeze air, it's easy peasy. Now, if you take that bicycle pump and you fill it up with water, good luck with that, right? It, you, you, if you pinch off the actual thing and try to squeeze it, you're not gonna get her done. So the problem is the bulk modulus for water is really huge. Now the density is kind of weird because you think, okay, well, high density should make the thing, the particles uh, go slow. And that that's true, right? So you expect maybe, well, water is like a thousand times more dense than air. So maybe you expect sound to slow down in the water. But, and it turns out as that equation showed, velocity is inversely related to the density. It's the square root of the bulk modulus divided by the uh, density. So that is correct. The higher the density, the lower the velocity. But while the density of air went up by a factor of 1,000 to get to the density of water, the, dense, the bulk modulus went up by a factor of about a million to get to the bulk modulus of water. So basically what you're getting is a square root of roughly 1,000 times the speed of sound in air is what the speed of sound in water is. And because that, that speed is so fast, your brain can't detect which ear got the signal first. So all sound sounds like it's coming from everywhere. That doesn't mean sound's not useful. We still carry metal objects with us when we're scuba diving and we'll clap it on our, our uh, tank, for instance, to get the other person's attention. The person just will have no idea which way it came from. So I have to look everywhere, which like I said, that can be helpful too in a scuba diving setting because often you don't necessarily call someone's name because you want them to look at you, you know, like if, you know, if a, a vehicle is coming towards your, your dog or something like that, you call their name. If they look towards you, that might not do them any good. But if they look back and see a car, then maybe they'll move, right? So that's the same thing with scuba diving. You, you don't necessarily want them to look at you just because you called their name. So uh, either way, it helps. But that's, a, that's an everyday life example of how this behaves. Now, we've got that. We've got these different velocities. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about what the moduli are. So I'm going to go back to my document cam. Uh, we still got several minutes left. So I'll go back to my document cam and I want to talk to you about what moduli are. So uh, moduli is the plural of modulus. So um, in general, a modulus, here's where I need my glasses. In general, a modulus is stress over strain. So that's the definition. Modulus of any type is always stress over strain, okay? Notice the word stress has R-E-S-S -S in it. Notice the word pressure has R-E-S-S -S in it. That's what keeps me straight about what's what, okay? So the stress is uh, usually a pressure, so you can almost always say this is gonna be force per unit area, but sometimes you can talk about shear stress, in which case, Shear stress which we talk about in shear walls and things like that. Shear stress is like uh, delta L over L where we're literally talking, you're pushing on this object like this. It's length from here to here is L, but you're applying a force this way and that causes this to move an amount delta L, right? So that can be what stress is. That's a shear stress. But again, that's still, uh, or actually that's a shear strain, I should say. The shear stress would be the shear strain. The shear stress, on the other hand, would be the force divided by L, okay? So again, the, the length is actually perpendicular to that, but you're talking about a shear wall and it's, it's ability to try to shear. So that's the shear stress and the shear strain would be this. So the, the shear modulus is 
is stress over strain. So that's force per unit length divided by change in length per unit length. That's what the shear modulus is. And if I remember correctly, most books call that just plain S. Okay. Uh, the the uh, elastic modulus is the one we talked about a second ago. That's force over area divided by delta L over L. In that case, what we're talking about is applying a force F to an area. I wrote F, I said F, but I wrote area to an area A, that's the cross-sectional area right there. And this thing is going to actually shrink by an amount delta L. So that's what delta L over L is. Delta L would be this length divided by that parallel length. And the, sh the stress would be the force per unit area. So that's the elastic modulus. The bulk modulus, on the other hand, V is force per unit area over delta V over V. And you can subscript all these zero if you want. That might make it a little clearer of what we're talking about. But the shear stress is the weird one because you're literally talking about applying a force this way and comparing it to a length that's perpendicular to it. So that's the one that always seemed weird to me, but that's actually a very important one. That's, that's what tells you how big a diameter of a bolt you should use when you're coupling two beams together or something like that, okay? So that's what these moduli are. Like I said, if you look in chapter 12, uh, you can see tables of them and stuff like that. Or if you look at the Wood Forest Products, uh, uh, Wood Forest and Paper Products Association, Wood Forest Paper Products Association uh, releases. They release them every year, but you have to buy them uh, even though they make them fairly cheap, but they release them every year. You can find them on the internet for old ones. And, and really, you don't see much of a change from one year to the next. Uh, but they also can, uh, you know, tell you the difference between spruce pine fir and southern yellow pine. For instance, we always use all our southern yellow pine for salt-treated lumber, specifically because salt-treated salt lumber, uh, when you go to do it in engineering practice, you have to multiply it by all these factors to make it stronger or weaker. For instance, if you have several of them at 16 inches on center, they act together a little bit stronger than if they were one a piece. So you can multiply it by like 1.2. But if they're submerged under uh, moist ground, you have to multiply it by 0.95. Or if they're underwater, you have to multiply it by 0.9. So there's all these little multipliers that you have to do. And the salt treated ones have to be multiplied by multipliers that are really smaller than one. For that reason, they take the strongest wood, which is the southern yellow pine, and uh, use that for, uh, for salt treated lumber, what they call salt treated or whatever. Okay. So, any questions about that stuff? So, that's a little bit more on the engineering side. I think that's kind of a, a fun thing to talk about. Uh, I, I used to do structural engineering. So, that's sort of one of my passions. I still like it. I, I love going through houses. Uh, uh, under construction and see the cool stuff they're using, TGIs and paralams and microlams and engineered beams and all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, so next, what we want to talk about now is the principle of superposition, which is uh, a, uh, a principle that's listed in geology too, but it's a slightly, slightly different one, even though it's somewhat related. And that's this, the principle of superposition. And that just means basically that when two waves collide, they just add up amplitude to amplitude. So let's imagine a scenario. Let's imagine this wave, which I'm going to make sort of long and fat. And this wave, which I'm going to make skinny and tall like that. This wave is moving towards this wave, and this wave is moving towards that wave. When they get on top of each other, here's what's going to happen according to the principle of superposition. So I'm going to try to draw that same wave and I'm going to try to draw the same wave here. Uh, 
like that. And I'm going to say this is wave A and this is wave B. And then I'm going to add them to get wave A plus B. So what I have to actually do is one by one, I add the parts that line up. So I go, there's zero all the way from here to here. And there's zero all the way from here to here and all the way from here to here and all the way from here to here. So basically all this is zero, all this is zero. Uh, then this is sort of zero and you'll see what I mean by that in a second. So what I'm gonna do is now the sum of these two waves according to the principal superposition is we just add the amplitudes. Well, this one's just, since all this is zero, this was just the amplitude of the wave that I had. So I'm gonna try to draw exactly that again which should look like this, okay? That's supposed to be identical to this. Okay, now at this point, I'm gonna take this height, which is right about there, and I'm gonna to add to it this height, which is right about there, so I get this. And in fact, what you'll see is it looks like that. Now, this wave is moving this way, so a split second later, it'll look like this on top. And a split second later, it will look like, or a split second before, say, it'll look like this. So that's what we mean by the superposition principle. And not only that, after the fact, they're going to be as if they never interacted at all. So sometime later, you'll get with this wave going this way and this wave going that way. So that's what happens when they interact. When the, when the hump of the bottom wave is right here, it's going to look like this. When the hump is in the middle, it's going to look like the red line. And when the hump is over here, it's going to look like the red line plus this dotted part that's not there, plus this blue part, and then the red line. So that's what the principle of superposition says. It just says, hey, waves are going to add uh, amplitude plus amplitude. That's it. I always thought that when two waves collided, when they were moving in opposite directions, I thought they canceled each other out. Ah, that's called destructive interference, and that's exactly what the principle of superposition is getting us to. So what this principle of superposition says is if you take the sine wave like this, and let's say it's moving, say, this way, and then you got the, let's say, I'm going to try to line these up really well. And you got the anti-sine wave like this. Then when those two add, you just get that. That's called destructive interference. However, when you have, say, lining up with, then you get constructive interference. Okay. So yeah, you're exactly right. That, that's what they do, but this is how you get to that point. You got to realize that they're going to add point by point. So if they're not exactly the same form, you'll get weird shapes like this. But the coolest part is after they're done, it's like nothing ever happened. They just ignore the waves, right? So that's the way waves behave. Uh, that's kind of a big deal. You can do a lot of things with that. For instance, uh, if you go into a parking lot uh, right after it rained or out on the road right after it rained, what you often find is little puddles with rainbows in them and stuff like that. And it's, you know, ooh, it's a rainbow, it's a double rainbow. What's it mean, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm re referencing something I saw on Tosh.0. So anyways, what that is, is actually telling you some neat stuff. It's, uh, that's called the thin film uh, experiment or a thin film analysis. 
it turns out that when you go from one index of refraction, which is how fast a, a wave goes in a material, to another index of refraction, how fast it goes again in another material, uh, sometimes that causes a wave to invert. So it becomes an upper wave becomes a downer wave and a downer wave becomes an upper wave. And just like that, also sometimes when waves bounce off of uh, walls, they either invert or, or stay the same. Uh, those are real things that happen. But piece by piece, you can do an analysis of that. And you can say, okay, here comes a beam of light and it hits a little bit of oil. Maybe it flips phase or not. Uh, and then it bounces off this, maybe it flips phase or not, and then it bounces back up. And if it comes back out and a particular color is bright, that means that particular color suffered constructive interference. So you can tell from that what the thickness of that little film of, of whatever that liquid was by knowing, you know, whether it flipped polarities uh, at each interface and whether it flipped polarities at the backside, just by seeing whether it's off by half a wavelength. So if the thickness of the of the film is a half a wavelength, that's going to shift it by half a wavelength and would otherwise make destructive interference. But if the uh, distance is two halves a wavelength, then it should line up perfectly and make it constructive interference. Again, you still have to take into account the little bits and pieces of whether it's going to flip over by hitting the surface interface for the next one or by entering the first interface and that sort of thing. And, and I think that's covered like in chapter 31 or something like that. So you could actually see that stuff if you wanted to. But that's kind of neat. You can use that to figure out, you know, uh, why I'm seeing those colors. It, it, and sometimes those colors are, in fact, you know, due to oil or gas or alcohol or whatever but that tells you something you can also use those same little interference lines to measure very very small things so for instance you can take a, a plate of lucite and lay it on top of something like this and like let's say the lucite you know goes like this that'll be a very small angle if this thing is like a carbon nanotube a carbon nanotube is basically like you take a bunch of carbon atoms and you make a chain link fence out of them and then you roll the chain link fence up until it's like a long cigar or something just a hollow cigar or cylinder and and since you're dealing with individual atoms you're actually talking very small if you want to measure that you can literally just take and lay something on it and the light that enters that say plexiglass or lucite then breaks through the surface of the lucite hits the air bounces off the table that the carbon nanotube sitting on comes back up and breaks through the interface again, taking account of what's going to happen to the wave when it enters the lucite, exits the lucite, bounces off the wall, enters the lucite, exits the lucite. You can then figure out what that thickness is, and that thickness can tell you how thick the carbon nanotube is. So it's a really, really uh, cool thing that you can use interference for to measure very small distances. So there's a lot of cool applications to this. Uh, so I showed you that. There's another thing that's kind of weird about waves. And I remember uh, I was given a job by Prentice Hall uh, one time to write a solutions manual for like a LSAT and MCAT study guide. So the uh, LSAT, if I remember correctly, was the, whatever it was called. I know it was the one for the, that people take to go to law school. And the MCAT, of course, is the, is the standardized test that people take to go to med school. So I was writing this uh, solutions manual for uh, a physics prep for those two tests and the question it had was really neat because I never was taught it so I, I thought it was kind of interesting but now that we know all this stuff we can now answer these questions I need to know one more thing though and here's the here's the scenario I've always sort of I've already sort of showed it to you but imagine for a second that you got a string and it's tied to a anchored hook in other words a, a hook that's anchored to a wall like this, and you give it a, a pump so it makes a little pulse, okay? That little pulse is gonna travel. And if you continue that, of course you'd make a wave, but I'm just talking about a pulse right now. It does because you, you don't really care too much about it. Now this pulse is gonna come over here. And when it gets over to here, the pulse is gonna reach this hook. Now, the pulse is really the shape of the string and the tension always acts parallel to the string. So which way is the string pulling on the hook here? Upward. Yeah, uh, the string pulls 
up on the hook or the ring. Okay, so according to Newton's third law, the ring pulls down. So what ends up happening is the wave or the pulse actually inverts and you now have got a wave going back that way. So that's what happens when you have an antinode right here. Now, that's not the only scenario you can have. You can have a scenario like this as well. You can have a cord, again, a rope or whatever, but instead of attaching it to a rigid loop, we attach it to a ring again, but this ring is special. It's on a little sleeve that's on, say, a metal tube. Metal tube goes through here. And inside of there is this really smooth bearings. So we've got nice bearings in there. But the thing does have some weight to it. So what happens in this case? Well, we put a pulse on it. It moves this way. It gets here. And what way does the rope pull on that ring? Still upward. Still upward. But because this one's free to move to some extent, it's going to move upward. Okay. So, in fact, what's going to happen is it's going to rob this thing of some of its energy. And out will come a wave like this going to the left, but, but not inverted. Okay. So now I can take you to the place that they were asking students about in the book that I was writing a solution manual for. So let's imagine a, you know, three sixteenths inch rope that runs into a halser. That's the fancy nautical term that we use for really big ropes is a halser. Okay, you can see mu for this side is small. Mu for this side is big, okay? Now, if we take a pulse on this one and it's moving this way, then when it gets here, it's sort of gonna act like that, but it's also gonna act like this. So it's gonna wiggle, and that wiggle, of course, is gonna cause the wave to continue. And in that case, it's gonna get a really small wiggle on this side but it's also going to reflect and get a wave on this side going that way. So it stole some of the energy, of course, to make this fat sucker move, and it stole some of the energy to reflect some of it backwards, and that's what happens. On the other Smooth hand, transition. is that now? What if that was a smooth transition like a bull whip? Yeah, it would still do the same thing if, if it went to a different density. Uh, it would still do the same thing. I'm just trying to make it look as uniform as possible. But yeah, basically, anytime you tie two high, different density ropes together, they're going to act like it's going to cause a reflection and a, trans, uh, uh, and a transmission. So this is the transmission wave going through. This is the reflected wave coming back. Okay. Does that make sense? Now, if you did it the other way, oddly enough, the same thing happens. Only uh, when it got over to here, basically you're gonna get a reflected wave back and that's gonna be upright. And you're gonna get a transmitted wave forward and that's also gonna be upright. So what I'll do, I'll just make all those uh, black to correspond to the black initial wave, or excuse me. Yeah, I'll, I'll loop all these together by doing this. Okay, so this is the initial, 
and this is the initial. So that's some of the things that waves do when the encounter interfaces. We ran about six minutes over, uh, so that's plenty enough for right now. Uh, next time I'll talk about more about those uh, standing waves, which I, sh I mentioned to you, like plucking a guitar string. That's one case. That's another case. That's another case. This is lambda, or excuse me, L is equal to lambda over two. This is L is equal to two lambda over two. And this is L is equal to three lambda over two. So those are all the harmonics. This is the fundamental. Uh, this is the second harmonic, the third harmonic. This is the first overtone, the second overtone. Uh, so that's what we're gonna talk about next time. And then I'll give you a, a, the wave equation and tell you the general solution of it, just like I did with the simple harmonic oscillator and the damped harmonic oscillator. So you guys are free to go. Feel free to ask, stick around and ask me any questions. I got a little while for my lab starts. Not a whole lot, but I got a little while. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, have a good one, guys. Thank you. You too. Have a good weekend, Professor. You too. Thanks for coming. Yeah, hey, I want to talk to you about waveforms for a second, Professor. Okay, good um, one. Yeah, because this stuff's pretty cool to me. Um, so for my work, we deal a lot with uh, IP-based radios and mm -hmm. like high power. Um, let me turn on my camera real fast. Yeah, so what? we deal with like you know, IP-based radios and What's you know, those sort of things. What's that you're saying, different... something-based radios? Uh, IP-based radios. IP? So, um, okay. yeah, yeah, but it's it's just digital. That's pretty much all it is. Okay, gotcha. Um, but it's pretty cool seeing some of these uh, some of these guys that are kind of pioneering these antenna technologies and stuff and how they're actually able to modify the waveform and, uh, you know, do some funky stuff with it. It's pretty. Yeah, like frequency modulation and amplitude modulation and all that stuff. Oh yeah, uh, I saw a graph one time, and there it was this weird antenna, and they were actually able to get the the waveform itself to travel in a spiral, and then there was a receiving antenna that had the I think it was an opposite twist to it, and so they would only really accept that waveform in that that Smart, twist. Yeah. So it's got a chirality to it. Yeah. Yep. That's so cool. yeah, exactly. So yeah, if it bounced off of an object, um, or like you know you get interference or something the receiving antenna is not really going to pick up that interference as well. Right. And I thought it was like, yeah, that's all stuff on her. I have a yeah. former student who's now a, a mechanical engineer. He left and went and got his mechanical engineering degree and then he got a master's and he's working at NASA. And he called me one day, he was learning some wave stuff and he's like, uh, I don't want to, I can't make sense of this. And then what it was, was it was actually a frequency modulation and the, the guy had given him a problem to do a homework problem where he's going to, uh, multiply the frequency okay. modulation by a certain amount and I, I walked him through how to do okay. it and it was it was really nice he was really appreciative of it uh, but it, it was you know I was lucky enough to be able to explain it well to him where he was having some difficulties because it's you know tough when you're in a job situation and they're training oh, yeah. you feel like if you're the guy that don't get it you're gonna you know feel bad where he's a really smart dude he just hadn't had experience with that before mechanical engineers don't do as much with electricity and magnetism so where, where's the company no, you that's, work you're not allowed to say? Um, yeah, so I work for a you know, contractor, subcontractor, whatever you want to call it, uh, called Mission Mobility. So we work with a company called Silvis Technologies they're out of California. Um, we've worked with Motorola in the past, uh, a couple other companies and yeah, some, sure. so, some, some other companies.